You can turn your Bible to Isaiah 9, 6 if you would like. We're going to spend the next couple of weeks talking about uh, this passage in particular. So it's Isaiah 9, 6. Um, you think about what it's like to be a father, to, to have a child. There is a lot of uh, excitement, a lot of expectations. You, you don't know what this child is going to be, what they're going to do, what they're going to look like. And so uh, it really uh, just creates this excitement about the future. What, what's their personality going to be like? What are they going to look like? I remember specifically praying that our kids would get uh, their looks from Dawn. So I'm glad they did that and look more like her than me. That's that's great. We've got, I've got three amazing kids. You know, Levi is growing, becoming a man. Uh, he's just an amazing young man. He's got a very genuine heart. He's a great listener. He would, um, to a fault almost, he would rather lift somebody else up. He would rather see his sister succeed than him. So uh, right now he said, Alea, I hope you shoot a big buck. You know, he would rather have her get a great deer than himself. That's Levi. Alea is just wonderfully gifted. She loves the Lord. She's learning music right now, playing piano uh, in our house and just singing to the Lord. Uh, just a beautiful thing to watch your kids do that. And then Titus uh, is just a little bundle of love. Um, Somebody asked me one time if they thought that there was really truly such a thing as unconditional love this side of heaven. And if you ever meet Titus, you realize, yeah, there, there is. He just is super cute. I was eating breakfast with him this morning. I'll sit at his table sometime, which the top of his table is the height of a seat. And so the chairs are even lower than that. So I'm pretty much sitting on the floor and he's just eating his life cereal. And every once in a while, he'll reach up, put up for a hug. I'll give him a hug. And he just smiles like, that's what I need. Just eat some more, give another hug. It's, it's pretty neat. You know, when you have kids, you've got all this anticipation. What's their personality going to be like? And there's a, there's a kind of a time with every person where you could see their life and see kind of what trajectory they have. Here's the type of person they're going to grow into. Now, that's not always nailed down in stone, right? There are people that, uh, for example, are living a very wicked life. They turn to the Lord, and then the Lord changes their trajectory, right? They, it totally changes. So, uh, but there is kind of an age where you see that it looks like where this is, uh, where this is headed. Uh, for example, Kobe and Claire Anderson of Georgia, uh, whenever their little boy was four months old, he began to respond to sign language, and at four months old, started giving sign language back to his, his parents. Uh, at three, he was asking some really deep uh, philosophical questions. He's 12 years old right now. His name's Caleb Anderson, and he is duly enrolled in high school and in Chattahoochee Technical College, and he just got accepted to Georgia Tech. 12 years old, getting to go to Georgia Tech. They asked him what his plans were, and he said he wants to get his master's from Georgia Tech, and then he wants to do an internship with L. Ron Musk, and then he wants to go to MIT, and then his goal is to work for NASA or SpaceX. You know, 12 years old, you can kind of, wisdom kind of says, this kid's got a bright future, right? Like, so smart, he's got plans, he's got ambition. When I was 12, I asked for the G.I. Joe aircraft carrier. So, you know, you could see, like, wisdom would kind of tell you what's the trajectory headed this kid, we're just going to hope he stays out of prison. You know, my parents had high hopes. Uh, but if you could think about that, right, that's wisdom that you could look at somebody's life, look at the way they're living and saying, here's what they're going to do. And as a parent, whenever that child, when you first find out you're going to have a baby, there, there's so much of that you don't know yet. So there's like all this expectation. So when we read Isaiah 9, 6, uh, think about the expectation for this child. Think about what, what they're hoping for, what they think the trajectory of this child is going to be. Isaiah 9, 6. Uh, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Man, talk about expectations for this child. Here's, you know, here's the only thing we're hoping for this baby, is that all government, all authority is going to rest on this kid. That's some pretty high expectations, isn't it? I mean, I know my parents didn't get me that aircraft carrier, but I had expectations from them. They had different expectations from me. But this baby, the expectations are going to be, he's going to be the wonderful counselor. That is that if you ever need wisdom, here's the person you ought to ask. You have got a situation you don't understand. You've got something you think, man, I just need some insight. Clearly, here's who it is. The wonderful counselor, what the expectations are, the prince of peace, mighty God. This is going to be the greatest baby ever born. So here's what I wanted to do today. Uh, there's over 3,000 different people that are mentioned in Scripture, so we can't talk about all of them, billions of people throughout world history. But every child who is ever born, you could say this phrase, you could say that the parents were pregnant with possibility. 
that they're thinking that what's going to happen? What's the future going to hold? What, you know, what's going to happen with their life? What is the trajectory of their life and their story? And so what I want to do today is I'm just going to take five different babies. We actually have uh, several different kind of birth stories in Scripture, but five different babies that were born in Scripture. And what we're going to be asking with them is, what was or what is the trajectory, the kind of angle of their story? What's, what's being told and what's the expectation of this person? And really, ultimately, how does that fit in the grand narrative of God's Word? How do they fit into that God's redemptive plan. And then at the end of the message, what I want to ask you to consider is to look at your own life and to ask the question, what is my spiritual trajectory? I mean, if you, if you kind of looked at p- potential maybe and to say, where am I headed? And ultimately, isn't this what wisdom is? Wisdom and discernment would be able to look at a path and to say, here's where I think this path is going to lead. And so at the end of the sermon, what I want to ask each of us to do is to look at our own lives and say, what is this, what is this path going to lead to? What am I going to become? What's my, my potential? So we're going to start with a word of prayer, and we've got five different birth stories today. We'll dive in and read them from God's Word. Sound like a good plan? It's going to be a good day. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, this day. Thank you for giving me the honor of preaching your Word again today. Father, I pray that you'd allow me to rightly divide the Word of Truth. Father, I pray that you'd be with my mouth, with my tongue. Would you allow my words to be clear? Father, would you allow my thoughts to be clear? Father, I pray that today this message would please you. Father, you know in my heart how much I want to, to be known and to be noticed. Father, I pray that you would notice today and that of all the people that I seek to please, would today's message be for you? And Father, would you, in that, would you bless the preaching of your word in such a way that it changes our hearts and our minds? Father, would you use the preaching of your word today to sanctify your church? We love you, Lord, and we thank you for this day. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, Uh, let's talk about these five different babies from Scripture. We could do more, but for time's sake, we're just going to do five. Sound like a good plan? Let's talk about the very first baby that was ever born. This is in Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 says, Adam laid with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. And later she gave birth to to Abel. Now, really not a lot of details here in this first story. So if you could just imagine what that's like, you know, for us, whenever uh, we found out we were going to have a baby, you know, we had had a miscarriage before. So there's some anticipation, but there's also a little bit of caution that, uh, man, I'm not sure how this is going to go. And if you've ever walked through that before, it's really an odd emotional, like excitement, but nervous and not knowing what to do. And so, you know, we go into the doctor and we have an ultrasound and they, what do they say? They're like, here's the heartbeat. You know, it's real fast. And you're like, all right, you know, that's great news. And then, then a little later on, they show you an ultrasound. Now they can even do like a 3D picture. They can kind of move that thing around and show you a picture. We went to Lamaze class down here at Mercy uh, Hospital. And so went in there, got the instruction on how to hold Don's hand and, you know, do nothing and pretend like I'm getting credit. Yeah, that was great. I was good. Man, I was good at that. And all these different things. But for Adam and Eve, imagine what this is like that Eve, uh, you know, is pregnant. And Adam is saying, babe, I don't know how to tell you this, but you've been real moody lately. And it seems like you're gaining a little bit of weight. I mean, they don't have like mom to call to say what's going, this is the first one. And so what would that be like? I think uh, Adam would have just had to suck his foot in his mouth a lot. Like, why don't you slow down on what you're eating? It's kind of starting to show that you're eating more than your fair share. I don't know how that all went, but they have their first baby. And what we would just say, this is a little bit assumptive here, but if you could think about the hopes that Adam and Eve had for this first baby, first baby ever born, by the way, right? Man, what will he be? Adam and Eve, by the way, had walked with God in the garden. And so now if you could imagine that their hopes like, I hope that he walks with the Lord. I, I, I hope that our son here knows the Lord, that he hears his voice in the, in the cool of the morning, right? I, I, hope, he, I hope this one would, would know him deeply and intimately. And I hope when he makes the sacrifice, it'd be pleasing to the Lord. And so what happens as you read on, they do. Uh, both, both of them, Cain and Abel, both make a sacrifice to the Lord. So right away, Adam and Eve have got to be like high five and like our kids are doing it. They're, they're running the race. They're seeking the Lord. But what you find out is one of the sacrifices was not pleasing to the Lord. In fact, it was rejected. 
And so if you keep reading the story there in verse 6, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will it not be accepted? If you do not do what was right, sin is is crouching at your door. Its desire is to have you, but you must master it. So ultimately, the Lord's still giving Cain an invitation to say, you you can still seek me, just do what is right. This is good. It's not a predetermined, uh, you know, path that Cain is on. The Lord is pointing out his trajectory and says, listen, just turn and, and basically do what's right. And so you see what happens is that Cain doesn't do that. In fact, the wording there in verse 8 is that Cain does make another sacrifice, but the sacrifice that he makes this time is his brother. He murders his brother, and so then there's this great penalty that God, you know, curses Cain. And ultimately, when you look at the trajectory of Cain's life, and we would ask the question, what is he pointing at? He's pointing at the same trajectory of all mankind, that we're all cursed, that none of us seek the Lord. In fact, the next several chapters point this out, right? So for the next two chapters, you just find out that mankind is wicked, that they don't actually want to seek the Lord. The the Lord's pleasure is not actually their desire. You get to Genesis chapter 6. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness was on the earth and, and how it had become, that every inclination of their thoughts and of their hearts were only evil all the time. Verse 6, Genesis 6, 6, the Lord was grieved that he had made man on earth and his heart was filled with pain. You look at the trajectory, the very first birth, you know, the the first one that has the chance to get it right. And what does it point out? That the trajectory of all mankind is evil, that it's wicked, that no one, according to uh, Romans 3, that no one's going to seek the Lord. it's It's a horrible birth story, isn't it? Very first baby in scripture just is sad. It's heartbreaking, but ultimately it's going to point out that this is really what all mankind is going to do. So let's look at the second. This isn't the second birth story. There's a lot of begots in there. Uh, But the second one maybe of some great significance that we talk about could be of Isaac, right? So you have mankind is just headed to hell in a handbasket. I mean, literally, that's their trajectory is hell. But now God has a plan. And so we could look at the story of the baby Isaac. And this represents God's promise And so what he does is he picks this man out named Abram, and he says, through you, I'm going to bless all people. He makes a covenant. So Isaac is a baby that represents the promise of God, right? In Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, God tells Abram later on, he's going to change his name to Abraham. But he says, fear not, Abram, I am your shield, and your reward shall be very great. Now, we got a small crowd, so we'll ask for some interaction. What is the reward that Abram's going to have? He says, your reward will be very great. What's the reward or some of the rewards that Abram would have? Anyone have one pop out in your mind? Chirp, 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 chirp. You're right, great. It's the land. That would be one, whoever said that, the land would be one uh, that he promises them land. He says this, all that you see, right, you'll inherit. And another one we could say is that it would be his children. And of course, Abram's saying, uh, well, what children are you talking about? Trust me, Abraham, one day, look at the stars. Your children will become a great nation. If you could count the stars, you won't be able to count your family, right? And so, uh, but the third part of this blessing that the Lord promises is ultimately the the greatest part is this, is that the Lord in chapter 17, verse 8, he says, I will be your God and you will be my people. What is the blessing that Abraham has promised that Isaac represents? It represents that now this God that we have not sought that none of mankind has sought, that God has now sought mankind. You see, man's not seeking God. Their trajectory is towards hell, but God still loves mankind, and God now is pursuing man. He chooses one man that through this man, he'll bless all nations. And what happens? Abraham believes God, and it's credited to him as righteousness. And so you've got Sarah there in chapter 21. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. At that very time, God had promised him, and Abraham gave him the name Isaac to the son Sarah, born him. Abram was a hundred years old when Isaac was born. It says in verse 6, Genesis 21, 6, Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who, will, who would have said that Abraham and Sarah would be nursing children, yet I have borne him a son in this old age? Here's kind of the point of this picture is that everybody would have given up hope on Abraham and Sarah, right? She's 90, 
he's 100. And I don't, looking out, see anybody who's a 90 uh, or 100. But if you're close to that age, your childbearing days are behind you, greatly behind you, right? And so what Sarah's saying, laughter is kind of the key word in this story because you remember they actually laughed when God told them, right? This, this was a problem for them. And so uh, she's saying, everyone's going to laugh when we tell it this, but Isaac represents hope. And just as a small point of application before we continue, I want to ask you, do you have a hope that the world looks at as laughable, right? I mean, does the world ever look at you and say, this guy's just a little bit naive, He's always saying that it's a little bit sunny, that the glass is half full, right? That it ultimately, Isaac is a picture that we understand God has a plan. And that no, what does it say? It says, nothing is impossible with God. That's part of this birth story of Isaac is that they're looking and saying there's, there's nothing impossible. In fact, when you look at the qualities of a righteous woman in Proverbs 31, it says in 31, 15, she laughs at the days to come. Because you see a, a part of a righteous woman woman in this case in Proverbs 31 is that they're looking at the Lord and saying, I'm not concerned about what's happening in the world because I know the Lord is greater. And so my heart is filled with hope. Isaac is a picture of hope. Isn't this great? Uh, And it's a great question for you. In a day when the world is searching for hope, I mean, half of our country doesn't even know who the president is yet, right? Like all all this turmoil, you get on Facebook, and I'm like, i got to get off Facebook. And, you know, all these different things that are going on, that we've got a, a virus that's out of control and all these things. But the Christian, what does the Christian respond with? Hope. And even a laughable hope that the world would say, you look a little naive. No, no, I'm not naive. I know the Lord has a plan. And I can laugh at tomorrow because I know who holds tomorrow. Right? Isn't that what the song says? Hey, listen, y'all are a little dead. It's not going to get any better than that. That's good news, right? Okay? So just go ahead and put a smile. I can't see your face totally, so just go ahead and put a smile on. There you go. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Pulled the mask down, smiled, put it back up. Um, we can laugh at tomorrow. It's a laughable hope, right? So you have the first man. You see the wickedness, the decline of humanity. You see the second birth that we just told the story of Isaac. It is that God has a redemptive plan. If we looked at the third one, it would be Moses, right? If you're following now the story in, in Genesis, uh, the, the family continues on. They become a, a fairly large group, and they eventually go down to Egypt where they sell themselves into slavery because of a famine. You get to Exodus, the book of Exodus, and they're crying out to God for a deliverer. So the next birth story that you hear is this story of Moses. It's right there in Exodus chapter 2. They're killing all the Hebrew babies because they're very, uh, they're very fruitful, so they're multiplying. And it uh, talks about there in Exodus how the Hebrew women were just Uh, You know, they were great at childbirth. And so um, this baby born is Moses. And when Moses is born, the mom, to save his life, puts him in a basket, puts him in the Nile River, and sends him down. And who finds Moses but Pharaoh's own daughter? And so he, she pulls in Moses and says, I'm going to raise him as my own. I'm going to give him back to a Hebrew to nurse. And whenever, whenever he's of age, when he's weaned, essentially, I'm going to bring him back in. So when you read Moses' story, here's what you need to keep in mind, is that Moses' story is told in a series of 40s. The first 40 years, he goes from a slave to a prince, right? That he's born into slavery. He's set in the Nile. Uh, Pharaoh's daughter takes him up and basically brings him into the palace. So the first 40 years is slave to prince. The next 40 years is from prince to pauper. Remember, he kills an Egyptian. He he flees for his life. And so he goes from prince to nobody. Then the last 40 years is Moses being called back as a deliverer, right? And here's what's really interesting about it is that Moses then in this deliverance gives the people the law. He leads them out and gives them the law. This is what Moses does. But if you've ever read the story of Moses, the one thing that sticks out to you is that Moses doesn't make it to the promised land. And here's a great point for you today, okay? Moses, when you're looking at the trajectory of his life, there's a lot of symbolism here. Moses doesn't ever make it to the promised land. And here's the point, is that the law will never lead you to the promised land. It could only lead you to the doorway, right? So what is the point of the law? The law never makes anyone righteous. Just like Moses didn't actually even make it into the promised land because the law wasn't ever going to actually deliver people. It was going to show people how to live righteously, but more than that, it was going to condemn them because no one actually does. So you read Romans chapter 3, for example, and it says that, uh, therefore, no one will be declared righteous 
in the sight of observing the law. Rather, the law, we become conscious of sin. So remember, Moses, if you think about trajectory, Moses is the deliverer who can't deliver. He doesn't actually go all the way to the promised land. Just like the law never actually makes someone righteous. If the law were to have a testimony, here's what the testimony of the law would be. You need a savior because you're never gonna actually fully obey the law. And so this is why Paul writes in Galatians chapter three, verse 24, that the law was a schoolmaster, that it led me to Christ. Ultimately, the picture is the, the law is the shepherd, right? That it's saying here, you need a savior. You're not gonna be able to live righteous enough. So you have to, by faith, find the savior. So you look at the trajectory of Moses' life. He represents the deliverer who doesn't actually deliver right? In in many ways. Moses is considered kind of the hero of the Old Testament, and praise the Lord, the Lord used him. Uh, You read his story, and it's it's so up and down, it's hard to find the trajectory, right? What what is it? What are we hearing here? It's a slave that becomes a prince, but now it's a prince that becomes a pauper, and, and now it's the pauper who becomes a deliverer that doesn't actually deliver. It's so up and down, isn't it? It'd be hard to get a read on Moses's trajectory, but we know the Lord used him, of course. Uh, Now there's other birth stories that we could tell, but let's jump on forward now to the New Testament. So in the Old Testament, just to recap, you have Cain, who shows the trajectory of mankind's sin. You have Isaac, which shows the trajectory of God's plan for redemption of the people. And you have Moses, which is a picture of deliverance and of the law, which only leads us to the point that we need a savior. So we get to the New Testament, and it's interesting, of all the birth stories that happen in the Old Testament, there are only three birth stories that happen in the New Testament. Now, the third one is in Revelation 12, and I believe Revelation 12 is a history lesson that is actually looking back to a previous birth story of Christ. Uh, You could read that if you'd like to. So we're just going to only be talking about two birth stories in the New Testament, the first of which is John the Baptist. And so what does John the Baptist ultimately represent? You find the story in Luke 1, Zechariah, who's his dad, has gone into the uh, temple to make sacrifices, right, to minister before the Lord. An angel of the Lord shows up and basically tells Zechariah about the the child that's going to be born to him, that he's going to be given a son. You remember that uh, Zechariah, by the way, laughs at this, going back to laughter, and because of that, he's cursed with not being able to speak. He doesn't believe. So here's what the angel says, Luke chapter one, verse 15, that his son, John the Baptist, will be great before the Lord and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Does anybody know what the next part says? He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Now think about the expectation for the parents, for Zachariah, right? That he's saying, and Elizabeth, they're saying, so you're telling me that our son, We're, we're, number one, going to have a son in our old age, mind blown. But secondly, he's going to be filled with the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, even while in the womb. I mean, you talk about high expectations. Oh my goodness, what is the Lord going to do with this baby? You read on, Luke chapter 1, verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. Remember now, this is Mary after the Holy Spirit has come upon her, right? And so she's with child now. And so she enters the room. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, a baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled to the Holy Spirit. And in a loud voice, she explained, exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child which you bear. But why am I so favored that my mother of the Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. You know what John the Baptist was doing even in the womb? The first one to declare the Messiah is here, it's a baby. Isn't that great? That, that would preach a message, by the way. We won't go down just talking about uh, the atrocity in our day with abortion. But first one to declare the Messiah is here is John the Baptist in the womb filled with the Holy Spirit. Isn't this great? So you think about what's the trajectory of this child? Jesus eventually says of John the Baptist that no one born of woman... There's never been anyone as great as John the Baptist. So what did John the Baptist do that was so great? Because you, you'd want to know this for your own children and for yourself. If you, if you would aspire for greatness, John the Baptist would be a great person to emulate, right? So what was it that John the Baptist did? John the Baptist, his whole trajectory was this. I want to point to Jesus. 
In fact, when they asked John the Baptist, are you the one to come? And he says, no, no, it's not me. And the one who's coming after me, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. And in John 3, verse 30, he says, uh, he must become greater and I must become gr- less. If you want to live a great life, here's the simplicity of it. Make much of Jesus and little of yourself. That's the trajectory. That's the recipe for doing something great for the kingdom of God. Of course, we get to the last child born in scripture. We said revelation is actually a replication, a history lesson on him. And it is, of course, Jesus. Now, when you think about having a child and you think about anticipation, as I said, when we found out we were pregnant with Levi, we were just so excited. And it works out sometimes like this. We were the first one in our friend group. You know, there's five of us guys that traveled around in the band, no longer quiet. And, and so we're the first ones that were going to have kids, right? And so the, everybody showed up, right? The family came. I was going to be the first proctor that carried a son that carried the proctor name. And so we have family there. And of course, this is like pre-COVID, so everybody's there in the waiting room. We actually found a picture about a month ago of all of the guys leaning against the door. They're waiting to hear Levi cry, right? You talk about anticipation. They're like, oh man, we can't believe, you know, we're going to have a baby. Now imagine the anticipation from heaven's point of view. You have these angels that have been worshiping Jesus since they were created, since the angels were created. Remember, they're not eternal. So they've been worshiping the whole time. They're sitting on the edge of their seat like, man, I can't wait. He's going to be, he's going to be born. So you pick up the story here in Luke chapter two, there were shepherds living in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid for I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And talk about the anticipation of a baby. This baby is gonna be the hope, not for your family. It's not just gonna be the hope for your town, not just for an industry, not, not, just, not just for a nation, but for all people, this baby is going to be born. And then if it could get any better, it's like all the angels said, oh, no, you didn't. Oh, snap, you announced it without us. So that's like they rush in and they start singing, right? They start saying, like, they just, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace to men with whom his favor rests. They're just so filled with anticipation. So what about Christ? What about the trajectory of this baby who's about to be born is so great? Here's what it is. All mankind follow the pattern of Cain. Do what is right, but we didn't. God made a plan of redemption. Through you, I'll bless all people. The problem with Israel was they were the ones that weren't faithful with the covenant. God was always faithful, but Israel never was. You send Moses, the deliverer, who doesn't deliver. He, he gives them the law, which actually only condemns them, only shows them of their need of the Savior. Then John the Baptist comes and says, look, he must become greater, I must become less. So what's the excitement of Jesus? He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient Savior. God made him who knew no sin. That is, he completed the law. He was faithful in every way. And what was Jesus' single ambition? To complete the work that the Father had given him. If you listened last week, as Nathan preached, he talked about the work of the church, the work of the sent one, Acts 13 to Acts 14. If you back up and look at John 17, Jesus prays, I completed the work that you gave me. John chapter 4, right? The disciples come to him and they say, we got food for you. And Jesus says, I have food that you didn't know about. It was to do the work of him who sent me. Jesus' ambition, his goal, his aim, his trajectory was, I want to complete the task. And what was the task? The world needs a savior, and I'm the only one qualified. So Jesus gives his sinless life on the cross to be the only way that now we could have peace with God. Romans 8, chapter 1. I'm sorry, Romans, I believe it's 5, 1, that says, now through Christ we have peace with God. He's the only way to make peace, right? So here's, here's what I wanted to point at today. We just told the grand narrative of Scripture through birth stories. The first birth, man is sinful. The, the next birth we talked about, God has a plan for redemption. The third birth, there God has given the law, but the law only condemns you. The fourth birth, is the, it really is a summary of all the prophets. There is one who will come who will deliver the world from sin. 
right? That you'd look to him in faith. And finally, the last birth story that you tell in Scripture, all of Scripture, the stories of Christ, the sinless Savior, which God gave on our behalf. That God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. A beautiful story through births, right? What is the trajectory? Now, don't, don't check your mind out yet. Stick with me for a little bit because I want to ask you. Remember, I told you I'd ask you this question. What's the trajectory of your life? Where are you headed? If we're going to write your narrative, your story, there was a point where your parents were pregnant with possibility. They were excited about what your life was going to be, what it was going to become, right? And like, what's this person? What's their personality? Are they going to seek the Lord? Are they going to know him? And then you find yourself where you are today, and you may be uh, the person who would look at your life evaluating and saying, I'm not all that I wanted to be. Uh, maybe you'd look, evaluate your life and say, kind of, here's where I am. So let me maybe transition to some application through what happened to me two weeks ago. Uh, two weeks ago, I had a really bad toothache, and so I don't know if it was abscessed or not, but it was enough that it woke me up, which is a lot because I normally don't, uh, don't wake up very well. When we had kids, people would ask, you know, how are they sleeping? I'd say, great. And Dawn would look at me like, what are you talking about? Like, well, I slept great. So I assume the kids did because I never woke up. So a lot of pain when I woke up. So I'm sitting there on the couch and I'd been, bear with me here, I'd been thinking about shooting my gun. I enjoy shooting. And so I was thinking about ballistics. I have a friend who understands shooting really well. And he said, it's, it's a mathematical equation. You can take a couple factors, and I can tell you over a distance where that bullet's going to hit. So stick with me here. He said, when you have your gun, uh, you have the, the angle with which you're aiming, right? How high? Normally, they measure that in inches with a gun. And then uh, they have the weight of the bullet. How heavy is that bullet? And then how much energy is behind it, how fast it's coming out of the barrel, right? And then you have, it's what's called a ballistic coefficient, which just means how is that bullet shaped? as it hits the wind, right? How's it cut through whenever it hits difficulty? Is this making sense so far? So I'm setting up three o'clock in the morning, thinking about ballistics and how you can measure this out. And I felt like the Lord spoke to me and said, you can do this with spiritual trajectory. And here's what I mean by that. There's a couple factors you could look at. And instead of, you know, with a bullet, you're measuring over distance, but with a Christian, you're looking over time. And we could take these four factors and tell you where you're gonna land next year spiritually. Here's what they are. What is your angle? What is it your aim is in life? For many believers, for many people who profess the name of Christ, the thing that they're aiming for is heaven. And and let me just tell you what a pathetic aim that is. When you could aim for the king of heaven, for the center of heaven. See, the, the center of Christianity is that you would know him. I'm reading right now J.I. Packer, Knowing God. It's the, it's the centerpiece, right? This is eternal life, John 17, 3, that you would know him, the one true God, right? And then Jesus responds and says, away from me, I never knew you. It is about this relationship that do you truly know the Lord? Will you settle in your life for just getting to heaven? What is your aim? That's gonna tell me a lot about your trajectory. Is it to know him and make him known? Is that truly what you want? Secondly, we could look at the energy, how much, how much zeal do you have, right? Romans 12 says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor as serving the Lord. Uh, we could look at James where it says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It's gonna tell me a lot about where we're gonna land spiritually by how much energy we put into knowing the Lord. So what's your aim? Know the Lord. How much energy will you put behind it? And then how much weight are you going to carry, right? There's a a big difference in the trajectory of a cannonball and a 22. And a lot of it has to do with weight, not energy, right? And and so Jesus tells us to lay our burdens down. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says that you deny yourself, that is you lay everything down that has to do with you and you follow me. In fact, he says later on that anyone who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is unfit for service. Remember the guy who comes and says, I wanna follow you, but I need to go bury my father first. He says, you're unfit. Why is it? Because you'll never run run after Jesus and carry all the burdens. So if you wanna see the Lord do a great work in your life, you have to lay the burdens down. If you carry all the worries, you can't run. It's just simple, right? I could outrun Usain Bolt if I had him carry all the junk, right? 
have him load a couple kids on his back, all these things. You're not designed to carry those things. So what do you do? You lay your burdens down. And what you find is when you lay them down and leave them at the feet of Jesus, you, you trust him with all of your cares, you suddenly have lightened your load. You suddenly have an ability to seek him. We talked about this this last week, the conference I went to. We talked about one of the major catalysts and, and actually kingdom explosion is when people stop worrying about their means to provide for themselves. It's a very simple parable that Jesus talks about. He says that you, you see the sparrow, right? He doesn't care. He doesn't have a care because the Lord provides. You look at the flowers and what happens with the flowers? They're not worried. And he looks at us and he says, how could you by worry add a single hour to your life? You want to run after the Lord, you stop carrying the world around with you. Even think about like as a dad, the concern that I have for my children, I should have a concern. But the best thing that I could do with my children is to lay them before the Lord and say, Lord, would you work in their life? Would you minister to them in a way that I cannot? And it frees me to run after the Lord, right? And then what's the last one? We said this for, for shooting is the ballistic coefficient. How well does the bullet cut through the air? And for us, we would say that is faith. How well do you handle diversity? Because no, believe it or not, in the next year, you'll have more troubles, right? None of us expected COVID. I had a friend that said, isn't it interesting that so many people became so self-disciplined during COVID, during the shutdown. So many people lost weight. So many people ate better. But how many people became disciplined to seek the Lord? How many people actually grew in their faith? Your ballistic coefficient, for us, it is faith. How will you handle diversity? How will you handle the things that want to hit you? Will you, by faith, cut through? This is Hebrews 11, right? And by faith, they were sawn in two. They were ripped apart. They were before lions. All, all these things that they did, it was by faith they kept the course. I want to ask you, you evaluate your life. Where are you going to be in two weeks spiritually? Where are you going to be in a year? Where are you going to be in two years? We could look at those four factors. Just like in wisdom, we would look at Cain and we would say, man, I can tell you what. Here's the trajectory that Cain has. Coulda, shoulda, sought the Lord didn't. He was cursed. You could look at that trajectory in the same way you should be able to look at your own life and say, where am I headed? And I can tell you those are four things that will affect it. Is your aim in life to truly know him? Will you truly seek him with all your heart? Will you lay your burdens before the Lord and say, I trust you and by faith I will seek you. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Those thing, four things will tell me where you'll be a year from now. And in discernment, you ought to be able to look at yourself and say, is this where I want to land? And what should I do in order to respond? We, we have in Scripture this grand narrative. Man is sinful. God has made a plan. God has shown us the law by which it tells us the need of the Savior. He sent John the Baptist to say, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he sent his Son. By through faith we could be saved by looking to him. I want to ask you to take a moment uh, to evaluate your life as we read through that grand narrative and then you look at your own life to say, what is my spiritual trajectory? Maybe you would take just a moment to pray, Lord, what would you have change in my own heart? If you're here and you've never trusted Christ, I would say the very first thing you must do is look in faith to Christ. What is your aim? Is it to please him? W would that be what you would change in your life? I want to know you and I want to make you known. If you've never done that before, I invite you to do it today. If you are here and you're a believer, you may look through that list and say, here's the thing that I know is weighing me down. Here's the thing that's affecting my spiritual growth. And I would ask you, I remember Paul as he's closing his life, he says, I've, I've fought the good faith, I've run the race. You, you might even today want to begin to think about, Lord, in the next year, what would I like to see you do in my life and what would it take for me to get there, to seek you, with all of my heart, to aim for knowing you, nothing less. Father, we ask that you'd speak to our hearts today. Dear Father, would you give us a great ambition for you? Father, would you give us discernment on how we're living? Father, as we think about that phrase, just pregnant with possibility, Father, I thank you that even today, for me, 43 years old, 
You've still allowed me to be pregnant with possibility. You, you've allowed me to choose if I will seek you or not. Father, I ask that by your help and by your strength, you'd stir in my heart to seek you. Father, would you stir in my heart to give me one aim? Father, I know I can't aim at two targets at once. Would you give me one aim to know you? Father, for all the cares that, that burden my heart, would I lay those before you and trust you with them? Father, I pray that you do a great work in my life and in our church over this next year. Father, we love you and we thank you for this day. Would you, would you allow us to test ourselves uh, with a sober judgment today? We love you, Lord. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.